success. Look at us. 10.30. We're ready to rock and roll. Both projectors blazing. We're good to go. Uh, I'll take like a minute for any questions. So uh, I've created uh, assignment two. It will be released on Friday. So I'll have to create the test cases, make them be devious, and get my TAs to review them so they're not too devious. Uh, we'll see that. So yeah, it'll be released on Friday. It'll be a two-week assignment, just like before. We can talk about it Friday. Uh, any other questions, class-related things? I'll, I'll decide on a midterm time soon, and I will post it on the mailing list and on the class website. Any uh, questions on networking? Anything we've covered so far? All right. Let's get started. So now that we've moved on from... We talked about networks, right? We've seen all the different ways that networks can be insecure and how as an attacker we can influence uh, using our low level knowledge of networking protocols, right? We can influence the delivery of packets, we can spoof and send data or information as if it came from somebody else, right? We can sniff the packet, try to sniff data, we can hijack things. Um, so now we're gonna move on to the things that are actually generating the traffic, right? So it's not you know, networks don't exist in an isolation, right? They exist because applications want to use them to communicate with each other. Uh, so, applications at a high level, there we go. Uh, so applications, so they can provide services, right? Thinking about applications very abstractly. So what kind of, like, how could, can applications provide services? Generally. Think about all that different applications you're running right now on your computer. All notating apps, I assume. What are some of the types of apps that you run? Applications. Yeah. Performing the required tasks. Yeah, performing the required tasks. show you some things. It could be something running locally on your machine, right? which means that it's uh, you know, word processing or your, the finder on the Mac or Explorer on Windows, right? something to manage files, all kinds of stuff. Right? These are all, all applications that are running locally right, on your device or system itself. Right? So what would be the opposite of local applications? Remote applications, right? Something that's on somebody else's server. So what are some examples here of things that you interact with constantly? SSH, SSH constantly. <laughs> Facebook maybe for the rest of us. Right? That Facebook that Facebook application, right, does not the database of all whatever, how many billions of friends, right, is not resting on your computer. Right? That's on some Facebook server, and you access that remotely over the network using port 80 or, 55 or 443 right, to do HTTPS. But either way, the application is really running on their server. Right? What are some other types of applications? Remote applications. What was it? Web services. Yeah, a whole host of web services. Right. Your phone even, the applications on your phone, right? A lot of them actually use a back-end website that they communicate to, right? What else? Games? Yeah, games, right? You have the client running on your local machine and you have a server running uh, somewhere else if it's a multiplayer game. It could be it's not a server and you're actually peer-to-peer -peer connected with all, everybody else in the game and you're trying to decide you know, what's going on. <coughs> what about like uh, DNS, right? You don't actually have a DNS query, you make a request to a DNS server. Uh, right now, if you're connected to the ASU network, that would be one run by ASU. And then that job of that server is to serve your request and to go out and find the DNS entry and then give you a response back. OK, so right. So when we think about applications, right? so I, right here, we're taking the mind framework 
eventually we're trying to break you know, applications, right? We want to break applications just like we broke the network, right? We try to do things in the network that we weren't supposed to be able to do, listen to packets that weren't meant for us, uh, inject data into a stream that wasn't between us, right? So what influences the behavior of an application? So I like to think about like an application as kind of this you know, very high level thing. So what are all of the possible inputs that influence the behavior and the execution of that application? What's the big one? User input is one, but even before that, I, that the application know what to do. The operating system is another one. The code. Code, yeah, the application is code, right? It's nothing without the code, right? So it has some code. You, the user, can give user input. It's running on a certain operating system that provides services. What are some other things? Is it just the code itself, the code of the app? What was it? Data. Data, right? Yeah, so the application, it could be data in the form of I don't know, stored photos for a portal browser, whatever application. Or it could be configuration files, right? So the app can behave completely differently depending on what configuration files are there. You've actually seen how SSH can change, right, depending on the configuration of the authorized key file and the known hosts file, right? You can actually, I hope, part of the reason why you looked at the authorized key file, you saw that it's actually really complicated and you can do a lot of crazy things. There's a lot of options you can do there besides just give this person access. <laughs> Right? So, yeah, kind of generally we can broadly think about this, like, okay, the behavior of the application depends on the code, right? The data that's being processed, the input, and the environment that the application is being run in, right? So these type of things can all influence the, the application. So if we want to try to attack an application, what types of things, there, I think there are, I really hope we did talk about this. I'm pretty sure we did. What are the, th the three things that we want to try and compromise when we talk about security? Yeah. Confidentiality. Confidentiality, just one. Okay. Confidentiality. Integrity. Availability, yeah. So how can we do that, though? Generally, right? what are our options? Right? In a sense, we're trying to influence the behavior of this application right? to violate one of these three principles. So we're trying to either trick the application or force the application to somehow execute some behaviors that make it violate either confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Right? These are the core things that we want to do. So if we think about a model of the application, right? So this is what I like to think about, like, okay, so we have the application, right, and it's just kind of this nebulous blob of things, right, behaviors, right, but that's kind of contained within an environment, right, so there's some environment here. Uh, so what does an application typically run on top of? Are applications just executing on our processors willy-nilly? Yeah, the OS, right, so the OS provides a lot of abstraction to the application so that it doesn't need to know hey, this is actually an SSD you're writing to instead of a standard hard drive, so this means you need to do wear leveling and all this stuff, right? So the operating system provides this abstraction layer. Um, and then if our application wants to talk to you know, other machines, what else does it need? A network, yeah, right, which we saw. We looked at the network, right? So it's gotta talk somewhere. Um, I don't know, what are some key, key abstractions or features that operating systems I kind of talked about one, the file system. Right, what are some other? Hardware drivers. What is it? Hardware drivers. Hardware drivers, yeah, so it abstracts the hardware. What's that stuff? IO drivers. IO drivers, yeah, all kinds of drivers. Video card drivers. It's all about doing driving. <laughs> RAM? Yeah, so can you be a little more specific? Or <laughs> a little more abstract, but yeah. Okay. Generally, right, so yeah, so not just the operating system doesn't just provide us with the memory of the RAM, right? But it segments it so that each process sees a different part of memory. Right? So 
so that, that way we're not all in the same address space and just can overwrite each other. Um, so it provides some way that I can think of like separating processes, right? So that you know the whole idea here is, hey, it doesn't matter what crappy application you're running. If my application is well written, you shouldn't be able to crash my app. Mm -hmm. right? Is this always the case? No, unfortunately not. Right? You can actually break an Android phone very easily with a we'll go over fork bomb, a simple fork bomb, like a C program that just forks, and you can run that, and it will just take up all the process on your phone and break your phone, and you have to like hard reboot it to get it back to normal. Um, okay, and then so, but then, so where do we fit into this picture? So if we're remote, where, where are we kind of in this picture? Oh, yeah, through the network, we're off the left somewhere, right? Our packets are coming in over IP, GCP, UDP, one of those, right, coming in. We've seen how all that works. Uh, what if we're local? How does our input get to the application? What does it mean to be local? Either having the access of the system itself or in what kind of access? Like the login access. We're going to ignore, so we'll think about local just as the first one, right? So on the same subnet, we'd still consider that to be network access, right? So yeah, we have some way, we're going to abstract it here as the terminal, right? So you're at the terminal, if you're SSH, SSH gives you a way to remote in, essentially, and get the terminal, right? Or you're physically at the machine, mm -hmm. right? And you can interact with the process. You know, terminal here, I'm using kind of very vague, it could be a GUI, it could be whatever, I mean, that really doesn't matter. As long as you're able to get inputs to the program, right? And that's the important thing. Uh, so your input, right, is mediated through the operating system. So the operating system, whenever you, you're at the keyboard, every time you type something, a hardware interrupt happens, and the operating system gets signaled, and then it sends that command. It tries to figure out which process to just go to, and then it sends that command up there so we know how input's being read. Um, so what are all the things that the operating system, uh, that, sorry, that the application can touch, and what does it go through? I should say, wait, first before we talk about that, is this all the layers? What are some that are missing? Mostly hardware there. Hardware? The kernel. Yeah, the kernel is in the OS layer. So yeah, the OS has, um, so yeah, there's the kernel and then there's a bunch of different drivers to do all these different things. And the, current, uh, the OS itself is split up into a bunch of layers. Right, so yeah, the very low layer of the hardware, right, the hardware is not in here. What else? I mean, user interface? Yeah. User interface, mm, we'll, we'll throw user interface under terminal, just say that it's all input. Say permissions are kind of in the OS. Is there anything below between the OS and the hardware? What was it? Again. You have to say it louder. Middleware. Yeah, there could be some kind of middleware. Um, usually not between the necessarily the OS and the hardware, but maybe between us and the OS, there could be libraries we're using or other services. Absolutely. And we could share that with other processes. Our hypervisors, mm. right? Our OS, there's nothing that guarantees that the operating system is actually executing on the bare metal, mm. right? We could be running on Zen, and Zen is managing multiple operating systems that are all executing on one hardware, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but anyways, we're just gonna keep this at this abstract level because to the application, all the application sees is the operating system, right? What the operating system sees is the hardware, whether there's other stuff in between there, who knows, right? This could actually be an application that's written, I mean, you get kind of crazy where the, app, where the application is written, is a Windows application that thinks it's talking to a Windows operating system, but really there's a compatibility, either middleware or layer in here like Wine, which is translating between Windows system calls to Linux system calls. So 
actually the application is running on a Linux machine, but it all it sees is Windows. Right. Anyways, okay. So the picture is not complete, but we're kind of okay with that. Right. So. So then, what are, where are all the places that data can be in this? Like, what can our app communicate with in this diagram? Where can data? So we talk generally, right? An application is influenced by its code, which is going to be inside this blue circle, right? And it's going to be influenced by the environment, which we're just saying is kind of outside of that. Where does the data live? It's over here. Stack. Say that again. Stack. Stack. Uh, little. So yeah, inside the application there will be data. Yeah. What about in the diagram? So yes. Yeah, the file system, right? It could be reading files from our file system. Um, what else? The network. Yeah, it could go make requests, right? If it makes, if it tries to resolve any DNS entries, it's going to make a network request. If it makes any web requests, uh, HTTP requests. Uh, what else? Anything else? Could be from us, the user, right? We've kind of seen that we can get data into the system. Yeah. Memory and the registers. Memory and the registers. Yeah, those I'd say were, were I'd kind of say are all in the blue circle. Right? Kind of like the applications environment in some way. But where did that come from to even get there, right? That's kind of the, the trick. What about that other? completely disconnected circle from the diagram. Yeah, right? So most OSs have a way to do inter-process communication, right? So it actually could be memory mapping, so maybe that, um, right? You could map the same memory region, so that way when one process writes to it, the other process can read from it. But in essence, that happens through the operating system, right? So the operating system is mediating all communication between, between processes. So, why is this important from a security perspective to know, to know this? I mean, it seems pretty simple and easy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope I'm not blowing your minds here with right. the architecture of an application, right? So why is, why are we talking about it? do something it's not supposed to do. So what influences what the application does? The code, the data, and what else? The environment, right? So those are the three ways we could potentially attack the application. So if we'll actually look at exactly how the code is written and done, right? If we can arbitrarily change the code of the application, then we can kind of do whatever we want. If we can modify this environment circle, right, then we could maybe get the application to do something it's not supposed to do. But this data, right, getting data into the program, it's really important to really understand what are all possible ways that data can get into this program. And what do I, as an attacker, have the capabilities to modify, transmit, or influence, right? Because if I can change that data to get the application to do something that it's not supposed to, that's a security vulnerability. Right? So this is why we look at all these things to see, you know, maybe the application's great. Maybe it's 100% bulletproof. But maybe it relies on data from this process. And what if I can control that process? Mm -hmm. Now I can control that data that goes into the system. Right? Or what if we talked about networking attacks, right? Mm -hmm. Can I inject some data into this networking stream? Is it trusting an IP from another host, right, that I can impersonate? These are all kinds of things. And the file system, right? It's reading from files from the file system. You know, we talked about permissions. What are the permissions of those files? Can I mess with those permission, those files to get it to do something like that? Uh, so it all comes, so at a high level, what we're talking about here is basically application vulnerability analysis. So we're trying to understand how do we identify vulnerabilities in an application. Um, and so this is kind of an important clause there at the end, right? Like as deployed in a specific operational environment, right? So what? 
So kind of, let's try to talk about it and think about like what, like abstractly, what kinds of ways can there be problems, right, in an application? At the very highest level, before any code is written, can mm -hmm. there be a vulnerability? What was that? Compatibility with the environment. Compatibility with the environment? Yes, we're going to get to that. It's a little bit more low level, but yeah. The design of the application. What was that? The design of the application. Yeah, the design could be vulnerable, right? It could, the design just, like, uh, oh, we saw, for instance, uh, in the Morris worm, right? Does anyone remember what it used, the SMTP vulnerability that it used? It was a debug option that automatically executed the given command on the machine. This is the back door that you wrote. You wrote a back door that does this. This was intended functionality in the SMTP client. That's a design level problem, right? That's not an implementation problem. This is straight up, that design was broken from the start. It doesn't matter where you deploy that or how you do it. That's just that's straight wrong, right? And you could tell that before any code is even written. Oh, you want uh, you want anybody to execute commands on your computer? Probably not a great idea, right? So then, what what about okay? Let's say the design is good. Does that mean the system is secure, no vulnerabilities? No. So what could be a problem then? How we have code implementation? Yeah, right. So implementation, right? So how? Did they make a mistake, right? Maybe the design says, hey, only administrators should be able to execute these commands from a remote location. Uh, but it turns out, because of the way they coded it, right, that anybody can do that, right? So that's not really design level, that's more implementation level. Uh, let's get into this, we're talking about compatibility, right? So what is, so if we go lower, let's say the design's perfect, the implementation's beautiful, it's still, The OS itself could have vulnerabilities that can let someone in and take control of your process. Ooh. Okay, that's tricky. I'd say we're not going to include that in this model, but that is definitely something to think of in general, mm -hmm. right? So that's actually kind of why that layer diagram is great, because not only could they compromise your operating system, what if they compromise your hypervisor? What if they compromise your hardware? All the way to the very bottom. What if they compromise the firmware that's running your hardware? Mm -hmm. Right, there's all these different layers below you. Because yeah, as an application, you just trust the operating system. Yeah. The operating system has full control. Absolutely. <coughs> so let's say the OS is secure. All the bottom layers are secure. Design is fine, the implementation is fine. Bad data. Bad data. Boundary conditions? No, the implementation's fine though. There's no boundary conditions. I've solved, I've fixed all the boundary conditions. I handle all that data. What was that? Yeah, maybe, right? What about the environment that this perfect application is executing in, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What if I, so for instance, PHP has this really famous uh, configuration yes. option called Magic quotes, yes. which whenever any data gets into your PHP application, if there's any double quotes or single quotes, it automatically puts a slash in. Anyways, we'll get to it eventually, but it prevents SQL injection vulnerabilities. Only if your application is running on a PHP host that supports this application, so that supports this setting. They change that in one of the PHP versions. So you can take an application that's 100% secure, right? Take it from one operating system or one server, put it on another one, and because of the configurations of PHP, your application is now vulnerable, right? Or what about if you deploy a super secure application, and you have an administrator account whose password is, what was the first thing you would guess? One, two, three, four, five. Admin, admin would be the first one, password would be up there, right? <laughs> and the admin, admin account is active, right? Is that secure? No, and it's a deployment problem, right? Because nobody changed that default password. So design vulnerabilities are actually very tricky to find. Um, they're kind of the next frontier of automated vulnerability analysis. 
Um, because the idea is these are flaws in the logic of the application, right? It's like the logic is wrong, but the code is correctly implementing the wrong logic, <laughs> right? So how can you tell what is the wrong logic when the code is doing stuff that it's, the code says it's supposed to do, but by design, like it shouldn't be doing that from a security perspective, right? So these are very difficult because it depends on the exact functionality of the application, mm -hmm. right? This could be things like lack of authentication or authorization checks. Uh, it could be erroneous trust assumptions, right? Like maybe when we saw being able to log in to a computer from an arbitrary IP address is probably not the best idea in the world uh, because anybody on that subnet could impersonate that machine and, and log in. What would be some other ones? What are some other design flaws that maybe you've heard about or can think about in any application? Very big, very broad. Like, uh, All have of Microsoft Windows is a design. <laughs> yeah, there is a huge. Uh, for okay, but but there is a huge. Uh, uh, you know, once I saw in an inter internet video that uh, there is an option for uh, disabled people to you know use the sticky keys, right? So if you replace a sticky keys uh, file with a command prompt in the system 32 folder by pressing the sticky keys outside your login page, you can access command prompt. On Oh, that's nice. Tricky. Yeah, so that'd be like using an un like a feature in a way that it's unintended, right? So yeah, it's probably the design there is, is a problem. They should be checking maybe the format or not just executing something correctly. Yeah. So um, there's actually a lot of instances of this. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, just flaws in the overall design. So they're incredibly difficult to identify automatically. Because you need to not only identify what the app does, but you also have to try to infer what should the app do, right. which is very difficult. And it's completely specific to every application. So for instance, one of my, uh, the things I like to, uh, one of the ideas I like to convey to try to get people to understand that behavior is not necessarily a vulnerability by itself, right? So if I said, in a web app, if I ever use this, maybe you can stop me. Uh, in a web application, you can, anybody can change the content of a page, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a vulnerability? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the answer is it depends, right? It depends. Right. Is it CNN.com that anybody can change the content of that page? Right. right? That's a, secu a clear security vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. Like the security requirements for CNN.com say that only editors and journalists, right, can change the content of that page. It can't be any arbitrary people, right? right. But then what about Wikipedia? Mm -hmm. right. This is the functionality of Wikipedia. Literally anybody can change any page on Wikipedia. Right? You can go now. You can change any page. Right? It's not a security vulnerability. It's intended functionality. Right. So how are you going to automatically check for this type of security <laughs> flaw? Right? It's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. In both cases, there's not checks. Right? The code could be identical, but in one case it's intended, in the other case it's not. Okay. Uh, there's also a whole class of problems called uh, the confused deputy problem, which is in essence when a malicious application can be tricked into doing something on your behalf. So for instance, uh, I have this super beautifully separated firewalled application. Like I'm running this application, Let's say it's maybe malicious, um, and, but I say, hey, application, you can't make any HTTP requests. Right? I'm blocking you off. You can't make any HTTP requests. But I have a process on my, on my system that accepts inter-process communication requests and will go make an HTTP request and return the response. Mm -hmm. right? So now this application that I wanted to never make an HTTP request, it never makes one. It just makes an inter-process communication to me, and then I make that request. It's actually a really big problem in uh, Android, right? Because the Android system works on intents, so you can send an intent to any other app, mm -hmm. right? And so maybe you don't have the permission to do something, but if oh, I think we need to go downstairs, right? 
Well, I'm pretty sure we do. Thanks. This is a test of the commercial mobile phone oh, system. That's your phone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I remember that being louder. Maybe I'm getting <laughs> Yeah, so the idea with these Android apps, right, it's like, okay, maybe I, as my app, I don't have the permission to read all your photos, right? But does there exist an app on your system that, when it accepts an intent, will get a photo and return it back to that, that mm -hmm. service? Right? It's actually very tricky to do this 100% correctly. Um, so in this case, I have this confused deputy problem. Oh, it's a test, don't worry, test. Okay, so design vulnerabilities are kind of at the high level, right? They're problems with, uh, with the design. And then below that, right, we have these implementation level vulnerabilities. So this is when we say, okay, so is the app application coded correctly, right? What does it do on these boundary cases or these bad inputs that we said, right? So is it, um, I'm gonna ask which one's more likely. I'm not sure that's an easy question to answer. Do we have, still have implementation vulnerabilities? Yes, <laughs> why? Why do we still have uh, implementation vulnerabilities? Because people are erroneous on their type. Yeah, we're humans, right? We make mistakes. We still haven't figured out exactly how to write bug-free code. Can't write bug free code, we're never gonna be able to write vulnerability free code. Right? And so we're humans and we code things and they're not able to correctly handle unexpected events. Right? So generally at a high level. Uh, okay. <laughs> Test, we all performed admirably. Right? So what kind of what could these unexpected events be in the context of what we're talking about with the three? With the three ways we can influence an application. ringing and doing a test emergency going to cause a vulnerability? Yeah, but, but what makes it? What can make it crash? Like the, uh, an unexpected condition. Yeah, so maybe the input is weird, right? Some unexpected input that was expected. Exactly. <laughs> Different yeah. environment, it's being deployed for maybe? Yeah, it could be uh, the environment that does it. It could be that it got an exception that it wasn't planning on getting, right? You, could, you have an exception at the wrong part in your code, maybe that changes the state of your application and now your application is in an insecure state, right? Maybe you're trying to check if this username and password is valid um, and right before you go to set the flag that yes, or that it's invalid, right? Right before that, there's an exception that occurs and so you never set the flag that this user is not a valid user. Um, are all applications, single-threaded applications that always execute one instruction after the other? No, right? Even though that example we had for the applications is incredibly simple, right? there's still a ton of complexity there, right? We're make, we can make network requests, right? We can read from the file system, we can talk to other processes. We can have multiple threads in our application. Uh, so really, what if for most executions, the order of events are safe, but there's some unexpected way that these events can be ordered such that it causes a security vulnerability? <coughs> Very difficult to detect. Yes. Uh, it could be that the output of our program is unfiltered and causes problems. Could be that the output of our program is the input to another program, right? Which could then be used in the output of another program, which eventually causes a crash or some kind of problem, right? It's actually kind of a hard one, but it comes up in the context of cross-site scripting. Okay. All kinds of these. These are all kinds of things 
these unexpected events where the programmer didn't think about this case or uh, they didn't uh, anticipate something? Yeah. That loss in the database transaction. What about it? Say that again? That loss. Ah, yeah, so exactly. So that could be like an availability attack, mm -hmm. right? So um, yeah, and that kind of could be this unexpected interleaving of events, right? So it's like the dead base, the dead base, the database deadlocks, or maybe your application deadlocks because it's not handling its locks properly. Yeah, all these kinds of things can trigger a vulnerability if you're able to get it to somehow compromise the availability, integrity, or confidentiality. Yeah. Uh, the tool or technology that you're using for implementation might have an inherent vulnerability by itself. Yes. Exactly. So, uh, think about that. Yes and no. It all kind of depends. It depends on kind of where you define application, right? That, that right. level. Uh, if it's, for instance, like there's this recent vulnerability in the DNS resolver in libc that causes a buffer overflow. Uh, it affects SSH and all these other uh, protocols. So it's this core library, but it's used by so many applications. So if you think about like the attack service of your application, the attack service of your application, which is I think about as like, what are all the places that people can attack you, right? You have just the code that you wrote, but then there's any code that your code depends on, and then any libraries that you use, right? And it grows and grows. And then you gotta think about operating system if you wanna be really secure, all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I forgot what the question was. I hope that answers it, kind of. Yeah. Like, I was gonna circle back around, <laughs> reference it, I can't remember what we were talking about. It's good though. Okay, so then design, implementation, then we talked about, so there's also deployment vulnerabilities, right? So a completely secure app put in an insecure environment or misconfigured way can compromise the security, right? So, for instance, let's say your app is meant and tested to be installed as a normal user on Windows, right? So that's the environment it's supposed to be run in, but it gets installed as an administrator privileges, right? Which it wasn't expecting. It shouldn't be installed that way, but for whatever reason it is, right? And so now, because of that, it's insecure. Um, it could be, yeah, it could be that the application is installed and it's supposed to be that a certain file is read only, mm -hmm. right? But it turns out for operating system misconfigurations that that file is actually writable. Uh, I'll tell a kind of personal story. Like one of the first servers, like actual servers I was renting, I think it was one of those $5 a month servers. I couldn't SSH to the machines, my website was down. So I wrote this like, you know, ticket. I was like, I don't understand. I can ping it, it seems up, but I can't SSH to the machine, can you help me? figure out what's going on, and they reply back with, oh, okay, yeah, your machine is up, but it seems that the permissions on your authorized key file and in certain SSH directories were 777, which means readable, writable, and executable by everyone on the system, and so if SSH detects this insecure configuration, it won't allow you to enter the system. And I was like, oh yeah, there was that time that I couldn't get things to work, so I just did a chmod 777 on everything. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> so, anyways, I've learned since, but you know, I was very new, and I was like, ah, it doesn't work, just make everything readable and writable. That'll solve all the problems. Which is how you can have security problems, right? Is Especially if you have maybe development and operations separated, Right, so app, the app developers just pass the app to deployment and they're supposed to deploy it on the server. Maybe they don't realize that this file has to be read only, otherwise the entire security of your application can be compromised. Um, yeah, we talked about like easy to guess default credentials, right? Admin, admin, all these kind of stuff. And the host one. Um, so the idea is, way, the way you can kind of tell, right, is if the application was deployed successfully, it would not have this vulnerability. Right? Whereas an implementation, doesn't matter how you deploy it, it's still gonna have that vulnerability. Modulo and deployment kind of mitigation, exploit mitigation techniques, but that's a whole other issue. Um, and then design, right? Design is just, it's always gonna be bad, it doesn't matter how perfectly you code it. So let's talk about the difference between a remote and a local attacker. Right? So what are the differences? 
from our diagram. Think about that diagram, right? So the app, the environment, the terminal with the local user, mm -hmm. and then the network. What are the differences? I mean, besides one is local and one is remote, right? So those are the inherent differences. What does it mean for vulnerabilities, for security? Direct injection of the attack and indirect injection of the attack. What's the difference? Like uh, in local, you can directly inject uh, some platform uh, data and then the one is actually go to the network and then Yeah, so the big difference, right, is exactly that. So if we want to do a remote attack, any the only way from that diagram to get data into the and influence the application, right, is through the network. Right? You can't influence the application in any other way. Right, except for that network error. But if we're local, then we have a lot more options. Right? Can we mess with the file system that it's reading data from? Can we mess with the process itself while it's in memory? Can we mess with any of the processes that it relies on? Can we mess with any temporary files it creates? Right? We have a much greater view as a local attacker. Um, right? So what's the downside? Can you do this to every machine? Yeah, you need to have either physical or, you know, you need either physical access or SSH access to the machine, right? You need to be somehow executing on that machine arbitrary code in some sense, right? Um, so you need to either have an account or compromise another application to get control there, right? And the idea is, once you're on there, right, well, you can already execute code on the server, right? You're there typing commands in, you have an account, you can type stuff in, right? You can run things. So really what you're looking for is to get more privileges, right? Like, you want to take over my account, or you want to take over the administrator's account so you have full control over the system. Uh, so usually what you're looking for as a local attack is a privilege escalation to try to get to a higher privilege level. In general, they're easier to perform. Why would that be? Well, well, better knowledge of the environment? Yes, okay, what else? You don't have to go through the network. Yeah, you can, you're on the machine, you can see things, you can maybe look at the processes. Uh, you, you actually know the entire environment, right? So you know exactly, is it 64 or 32 bit system, right? What library of libc is installed? What version of Ubuntu are they running? Right, what's the kernel version number? All those things you have access to and can understand, whereas if you're remote, all you're doing is talking to that machine on that port, right? So often local attacks can be uh, easier. Um, so remote attacks, right? Uh, so you can have unauthenticated remote attacks, right? So unauthenticated just means that the application doesn't know who I am. And remote means I'm coming from somewhere else. So, I don't know, is that better, more severe? on that port can take over that process, right? Whereas a local attack, you need to have local access to the system, right? So in some sense, these things, these things can be staged. Um, and the idea is, I'm not trying to, I mean, I am trying to escalate my privileges, usually from somebody who's remote on the machine to now something local. So I want to try to get the privileges of that vulnerable application, right? If I can do that, then I can do a lot of cool stuff. So in general, these are compared to local attacks. They're more difficult to perform because you don't know what's the operating system, what's the security mechanisms, what's the version of libc, all this kind of stuff. You may not even know the architecture, ARM or x86 or MIPS. 
Right? It could be, it's just a network application. You don't know. Um, so this is why we looked at things like OS fingerprinting from the network level. Right? Because if you can tell, now you have information that can help you in mm -hmm. successfully launching a remote attack. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So let's talk about the high level, <coughs> the life of an application, right? So what, you want to write an application, what do you do first? Very high level. Hmm? Design. It's design. Design it, get some requirements, write it, right? Are you going to write it in ones and zeros? <laughs> yep. No. Sure. It would be fun. Okay. No, you first write it in like a higher level language. Right? So you write it in like, I don't know, even C, C++, Java, Python, whatever. You write it in some language. Uh, the, ob the application is translated or compiled, right, to some kind of executable form. It saves into a file. Uh, it may be that... It could be, what's the difference between interpretation and compilation? Interpretation is line by line in what sense? It goes through the code and then whenever there's an error, it stops. Yes, but what it's also doing is it's going, what is it doing if it's going through line by line? That's a question. <laughs> what is it doing? Trying to check errors, it is doing all those things, it's also doing something else, and that's the key difference between interpretation and compilation, right? When you compile something, you're also going through the whole program, right, line by line, looking for syntax errors. Yes, and what does interpretation do? Yes, executes, yeah, that's the key difference, right? Interpretation goes through the program and is executing the behavior of that program, right? Whereas compilation takes the program and translates it into some other form, right? Machine code, whatever, that it can later be executed. Yeah, so those are the key differences. Uh, and obvious, and these differences can be muddled, right? So like a Java program, right, is a Java application. So do you interpret a Java file? No, right? Yeah, you compile it to a class file, which is specific Java bytecode. That Java bytecode can't run on the machine directly, right? So you use an interpreter that interprets that Java bytecode and then performs the actual execution. Right? Whereas when you run a C program, you compile it to, we'll see in a second, an ELF file that the operating system knows how to load into memory and actually start executing. So, once you've written it, it's compiled, translated, saved to a file somewhere, right? You load it into memory, you execute it, and then the application terminates. Right? So, at a high level, we're going to we're kind of going to ignore a little bit the interpretation compilation question in some sense. I mean, we'll look at interpretation right for a little bit, but we're going to focus on compilation. And the idea is, well, every interpreter, like some, somewhere, some binary code's got to be executing, mm -hmm. right? So, like Java, the Java virtual machine is written in C or C plus plus, right? And it's running actual machine code, and it's even dynamically translating the Java bytecode to machine code on the fly. Right, so we just talked about this, right? The program is passed to an interpreter. It may be translated into some intermediate representation. For instance, like Python will do an interpretation, but it'll also create a PYC file, right, that has Python bytecode, so that next time it doesn't have to do the whole interpretation process. It can just do that bytecode. And the important thing is each instruction is parsed and executed as it's going through this file, right? So it's executing it as it's going through. And what this allows, this allows actually a lot of flexibility, a lot of co really cool features from interpreted language. So what does this mean, generate and execute code dynamically? Based on the input of the first line, it can change and the, uh, the execution can act on. Can you do that with a regular program too? But it is like, once it is compiled, then it's yeah, so you can actually take a string, right, and interpret data, some string, and interpret that as code, right, and just start executing it, right, because you have an interpreter, right, so a lot of these, uh, these interpreted languages allow the programmer to say, hey, evaluate this string, take this string, 
interpret it as if it was a line of code in this program right here and execute it right, right away. So Python bash and JavaScript, uh, this is wholly and terribly evil. Right. We'll look at why later, right? But at a high level, you're thinking about, okay, I want to ex have this program execute arbitrary code. If I control this string, I can literally make the program execute whatever code I want, mm -hmm. right, which is exactly what we want. Cool. All right, we'll stop here, and then we'll look at compilation, and we'll get into the nitty gritty of what objects and binaries look like on x86. Thank you.